Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Geoscience Australia's Wednesday seminar. My name's Marie Wilson, and I'm the branch head of the National Earth and Marine Observations Branch here at GA, and I'm really pleased to chair today uh, with our Oz Seabed presentation. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to extend that respect to any First Nations people participating in our seminar today. This morning's seminar is entitled Oz Seabed, three years of coordinating seabed mapping efforts. Are we there yet? And the presenter is Dr. Kim Picard. Australia's maritime jurisdiction covers over 10 million square kilometres, and we estimate that only 25% of the seafloor has been mapped to the adequate resolution required to, sustain, to support the sustainable development and management of our marine estate. Considering that seabed mapping underpins most aspects of ocean sciences and engineering and contributes strongly to Australia's economic, environmental and social values, it's critical that we address this fundamental knowledge gap. Oz Seabed was founded three years ago, a cross-sector collaborative national program aimed at coordinating ocean mapping efforts to maximise benefits to stakeholders. Oz Seabed is working to address many challenges surrounding efficient data acquisition, quality assurance, processing and delivery to various end users with an aim to eliminate duplication of effort and improve data quality and consistency across sectors. Kim Picard is a passionate marine geoscientist who has worked at Geoscience Australia since 2012. Kim led the establishment of the Oz Seabed Program and has chaired the steering committee since its inception. Over her 20 year career, she has worked for three international geological surveys and sa sailed on over 30 multidisciplinary expeditions around the globe. Her research focuses on using seabed mapping techniques to understand the processes that shape the seafloor across a wide range of marine environments. So I'll hand over to Kim. Thank you, Marie. So good morning, everyone, from wherever, any, um, wherever you come from. It's our love and the connection to our ocean, or should I say the one ocean that is all connected, that connects us together. Today, I'm, I'm happy to be presenting a, a Geoscience Australia webinar in 2021 because this year marks the beginning of what we call the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. This decade will be focused on the science we need for the ocean we want. This is a big statement, but I know from my part that I want an ocean that is healthy and provides what we need for generation to come. For this, I know that we'll need a safe ocean, a predicted ocean, an accessible and transparent ocean, and an engaging ocean. This is our seabed, that national initiative that I will be talking about that focuses on the ocean floor, will contribute to the science we need for the ocean we want. As Marie mentioned, I'm Kim Pika, and I work for GA, and I'm the leader of the program, as well as the chair of the multi-sector steering committee that we have here. Before I launch with my chair hat of this broad initiative, I'd just like to highlight why GA um, here. When we think of geoscience, many of us think that terrestrial, because this is what we're surrounded by every day, not just geoscience, anything we do is from a terrestrial perspective around us. But geoscience and understanding the earth to solve our needs of today and tomorrow goes beyond this. G is committed to mapping and understanding Australia's seabed, but we know that the ocean and our economic exclusive zone, as Marie pointed out, is very large. It's amongst the, third, the three largest in the world. And under this understanding it, sorry, is a big endeavor, and it won't be done by, by ourselves, and it will be done by collaboration. So this is where I'm gonna lead you to through this presentation. So there's five points, uh, five sections to this presentation. I'll talk about the fundamentals of seabed mapping, the journey of our seabed. What have we accomplished last year? What we're gonna accomplish this year and into the future? And I'll try to, by that point, hopefully I'll be able to tell you, are we there yet and what we've taken on? So what is seabed mapping? To us, seabed mapping is exploring and characterizing the ocean floor. We wanna know what's there so we can manage it effectively and sustainably. sustainably. We wanna be able to 
monitor the state of our ocean as we move forward. We want to know how it changes, how healthy is it healthier, is it less healthy? Do we go or do we not go here? Here you see three images of Cocos Island. The first one on the left is a satellite image that shows the ocean surface and luckily the lagoon floor because the water is so pristine. The second one in the middle shows the topography model or a bathymetric model, the bottom of the ocean at the land at, at coarse resolution. And the right one shows the, a high resolution map that's been put together from multiple types of sensors collecting data. We get much more detail. How do we get this high resolution? Here in this image, you see the investigator, the research vessel, our only national blue water capability vessel that's collecting seabed mapping data in this image. There's a suite of information we collect. And here you see um, a multi-beam collecting data. We see the topography or the bathymetry of the seafloor, the shape. We see backscatter. This is the reds and the blue colors here, which is an indication of the hardness of the seafloor. The blue showing the softer material, more muddy, and the red probably the sandy, more gravelly bottom. And in black and white, we have the sub-bottom profile. This shows us the subsurface, what, what lies beneath. And that's important uh, where we see um, and some of the darker shade here is because there's a, a bit of sediment and they match with the blue colors where there's mud. We can penetrate that substrate. Characterize, ca characterizing the seabed is not only those three types of data, but also sediment sample, getting physical information and also biological sample. But really the combination and the integration and the interpretation of this data is where the power lies. This is where we can start answering the questions that we have about the ocean. This question may be, where are the most sensitive marine habitats, the most beautiful seabed I can go dive on or explore as I come and visit Australia or stay in Australia to visit our own Australia? How will my beach or my house be affected by coastal erosion and some storm surge in the future? How can I navigate safely and find the best bombies to go fish on? Or where would I put the renewable infrastructure that would answer those? We need fundamental data and that is seabed data. Until now, the value that we put in seabed mapping was unknown. We knew it was large, considering uh, its place as a fundamental information, but how much of the overall 70 billion worth of the blue economy today did it take? Well, to do it, to no more, we commissioned a, um, an economic benefit analysis with Deloitte and just fresh off the press, it's gonna be published very soon, are these numbers. We were right, it's a big number. We're looking at a direct contribution to sectors in the order of $16 billion and the potential for up to 50 billion as we go in the future. That contribution is across many sectors, sectors, primarily defense, tourist, prote tourism, protection, transport, and many more. So again, can we answer the question? Well, unfortunately, every day, um, we know more about Ma Mars than our ocean. Every day, when you go out, you rely on good maps we have on land for driving, hiking, building your house. But we don't extend that knowledge offshore. We have these maps, thanks to Google, you can go, they're beautiful and at that scale. They're at the tip of our phone anytime we want them, but really most of that information is low resolution. I'm being map asked by manager, by different people all the time, how much is mapping? How long will it take? Well, this is a complex question and I'm going to try to attempt to answer a bit more of this question through this slide here because it depends on the on the needs that we have. For instance, the map, the previous map was low resolution. It was fantastic when it got delivered in 97. Um, it showed the plate tectonic. That information is great for the world Ocean model and predicting our weather forecasts. But when we come down to all these other more specific needs like biodiversity monitoring, is it changing? Where do we navigate? Where do we put that infrastructure? Everything I talked before, we need much higher resolution. Are we able to answer that right now? Not really, because we haven't quantified and qualified everything that exists out there. 
This is a really quick sh shot in the dark blues and yellows are what we know of the bathymetry data and the other types of data that exists. Uh, we don't know where they exist all of them um, together. The light blues is where we don't know. The yellow is what OCBID has pushed out in the last three years, uh, published, and we have a better understanding of what exists. But that's very little. When we push this globally, we estimate that about 20% of our whole ocean is mapped from a bathymetric point of view, from looking at the surface at the bottom of the ocean. This is based on the global mapping initiative that we are part of. We call it the Nepal Foundation JEPCO Seabed 2030 project. It aims to have a fully mapped ocean floor by 2030. So we've got a way to go, but we're on the way. So what is the journey of our seabed in all this? Here is our seabed is a collab collaborative uh, program made of all sectors, academic, industry, and government, and it extends internationally. It's very important we work together so that we can find the efficiencies and we don't duplicate the effort. As you can see on the map, it's quite busy and the distribution of the collaborators is widespread and we like it. <laughs> or see that in five steps. What is it? Our mission is to improve the coverage, the awareness, the quality, the discoverability and the accessibility of seabed mapping data for the Australian community. Our vision is by 2030, we want all of the seabed mapping data that is available within Australia's marine estate readily and openly available. And we want the new data mapping the gaps. We want, we want it to take into account our neighbors, more users, so that we can answer more questions. So in five step of seabed is coordinating effort is looking at quality assurance tools and guidelines to improve acquisition and understand what we have. It's processing more efficiently data and processing data, making it stored in a federated fashion. There's multiple um, stakeholders out there collecting data. So making it findable and discover that data. You want this data, we all want this data. So it's important that it goes out. OCBED is governed uh, very strongly. It, the, the governance was established in 2018 with a steering committee re uh, with representative from all sectors. There's 13 members on the steering committee and it, it has an executive board made of the five Commonwealth agencies that have high stake into understanding the ocean. So each board member have a vested strategic interest. I mentioned what Jay's interest was in at the beginning of this talk, and but we have a strong interest in coordinating this effort together. And so are all the collaborators pushing in, um, collaborating here. We always think the whole, we know all that the whole is greater than the sum of its part, and that's the collective driver. So what's the event in people? Who are they? On a day to day, this is this, these are the great people that meet every day to try to uh, advance our seabed. And, and they, not just at GA, the GA Frontier SI, CSRO. And then on the right here, we have the steering committee member, the existing one, and our thank you to our outgoing members. Um, they're the people you can talk to, and they're from the various sectors, and to have more information at any time. So where did we start from the evolution? Um, we'd like to, to point the start of our seabed to 2016, when we planted the seed, when we got some government together to look at what would be the priority for national mapping areas. It took three years to establish and to really establish the program and have that steering committee uh, together and the executive board. During that time, we built the community you saw earlier. We're still building and welcome everyone to participate and use the information we have and provide feedback. We're right in the midst right now of developing standard infrastructure and operationalizing all of this. And of course, data, data, data. We're growing the data all the time. So this pushed us to quite far in time but that, that's where we are at the moment. 
So in 20, 2021, we had a um, an extensive work plan and here have we accomplished what we had said to do. This is where we got to at this point. Our objective, our four objectives for last year were to secure the future of our seabed was to expand the number of bathymetric data openly accessible, deliver product and service for stakeholder and end users, wanted to improve the coordination of seabed mapping effort. So how did we go? In terms of securing the future of our seabed, so we would achieve that by formalizing agreement and uh, uh, some funding proposal. I'm excited to see that, that, that we have, uh, we're nearing completion of a collaborative head arrangement between the executive board member. In terms of securing, uh, in terms of our growth in the investment, we've seen 100% growth in resources in external resources to Geoscience Australia. Geoscience Australia is a fun, um, founding member and is contributing 47 in kind FT every year. What's, what's ex uh, extraordinary here is we've got um, this growth from the revenue onto the left side and the, uh, a very diverse number of partners. And then on the left, we have the in kind, which has doubled as well. And this is without forgetting uh, that the in-kind contribution of all the student committee members were continuously um, um, helping us. In terms of expanding the number of bathymetry data openly accessible, we wanted to achieve um, we wanted to achieve that by easing the process to submit data and integrate new local hub to this federated data hub. We know that with COVID that came to our door last year um, and the challenge that it brought, in fact, it brought the mapping community a bit of a gift here. Here on this image, we see the effort of the Schmidt Ocean Institute and many collaborators in Australia um, that took part in this big collaboration. We have the Schmidt Ocean Institute circumnavigating Australia and during the hard time of, of uh, last year, COVID ended up in uh, Queensland where they mapped a lot. Mapped over 200,000 square kilometers, it's a massive amount of effort. And what we, our seabed took part in this collaboration. We took advantage of this to push a bit of boundaries. Uh, we had a lot of ship to shore activity um, operating some of the system, but really to deliver the data into our seabed we wanted to we wanted to process the data as quickly as possible, so it was processed on board, but also at shore, and wanted to deliver it um, quickly. So we took advantage of this to improve our delivery pipeline. Some of our processing pipeline is still work in progress, but we have now delivered all of that purple line around Australia. It's available on the portal. It's quite exciting. It's just marvelous um, new information that came out of those survey, uh, including you would have seen uh, there's now a new ABC's um, stories online that you can see on the Great Barrier Reef that shows some of this work. In terms of bathymetry product on top of the Schmidt Ocean Institute product, we went from the year before at five to 80 new uh, published data sets. This is a large area. The area covers over 2 million square kilometer of data, and it's larger than Queensland and Tasmania. So there's all this data, <clears throat> sorry, available online. In terms of delivering products and services for stakeholder and end user, we said we wanted to diversify the student committee to have more end users on board to make sure that we address the needs and actively proactively engage end users and co-design infrastructure together. I was really excited um, last year we got external recognition in terms of um, having 
a co-investment from the Australian research data common in a platform project. This platform project will aim to deliver, um, allow users to create their own map based on the data that's available and published. I will talk a bit more about it. But it was fantastic. This is a collaborative um, with the value of $100,000 between seven different partners. Sorry. And what best than the portal to talk about how impactful um, we are. This is the portal. We've had huge traffic. The, the OCBED portal is one of the most visited, if not the most visited portal at Geoscience Australia. And the data download has tripled um, in the last, in this year. So people are visiting, people are coming, people are staying. How did we go? This is the way your window into how a seabed goes and into what you need. And so it's important for us that the end users put what they need and how we can serve better. So what we did last year is we ran a series of interviews to look and define what would the portal look like? What would be the functionalities that we need to make it easier on the, for the end user? And then we went to the community again and asked to prioritize these functionalities. So this came out with a priority and an implementation plan and that is on the way this year. In terms of improving the coordination of seabed mapping effort, we said we'd achieve that by getting a greater uptake of the seabed coordination tools and increase the number of stakeholder and end user that would use the guidelines because that would mean that the data that's collected is better and easier to ingest and share. So one of the point we got here is the Australian Hydrographic Office. We have a request, a survey request capability through the survey coordination tool. And in there, the any, well, anyone who's interested to have a part of the seabed map can request this information um, to the Australian Hydrographic Office, who will consider it in their annual planning process. So today, for us, it's the, the, the launch of what we call our annual webinar series. And so tomorrow, we're following with a more, um, more training and technical uh, workshop and webinar um, so this will be part, the survey coordination tool will be part of tomorrow's uh, session, uh, webinar, if you want to know more. In terms of guidelines, um, we've been, there's been a lot of downloads of those guidelines, and that is quite impressive. We've also, we launched a second version of it at the beginning of last year, and collaborating with the Marine Biodiversity Hub, who you see on the right had done, uh, has done a report this year on measuring the impact of multiple best practice, amongst which the Australian multi -beam guideline were published. And this is where we can see the, the, the number of download and how much the uptake is on it. So we hope to see great data coming in and easier to ingest as we come along and we go forward. And finally, as mentioned in the beginning, OCBED is contributing to the global effort, our data, and we work with the, the global group to share the data, to change the standard, to, to always improve the process, and to at some point, hopefully by 2030, have a map of our global ocean. In terms of community engagement, we have the webinar series I just mentioned today is that for us, it's the first one of the year. Well, last year we had the same at the same time, pretty much, uh, where we had over 260 participants coming from everywhere. It was fantastic. We shared a lot. We had many, um, many presentation on seabed mapping and the value and also training from uh, on the tools and idea exchange. So we're quite engaged, and if it's a reflection of engagement, our website also seen a lot of traffic. There's hundred percent increase on the traffic that we see coming through the LCBED uh, website. So we find that very uh, exciting and a good way to show that we are connecting. 
So what are we saying for the future here, for particularly for this year that we've just started? When I presented the strategy right at the beginning, I just saw the front page, I didn't exactly listed the program goals, but we're driven by four program goals overall for the 10 year. Again, it's on the improving that creation and the delivery of the data, improving the standard and the quality. We want to demonstrate the value of seabed mapping data for decision making and management and science and nationally coordinate our efforts. So what are we intending to deliver in the next, uh, in 2021-22? Here you see um, on this slide, I've put the um, the quarters and, and the goals. I've made them into swimming lanes. As you can imagine, many activities cross over those swimming lanes. But um, for ease of visualization, I'll put them in here separate. So we're going to deliver the annual webinar series again, which will um, go on for uh, this the next this quarter and probably a bit into the next one. We are working with uh, the U.S. on a bilateral arrangement. We have so much affinity and synergies to leverage for from, and so partners of the uh, executive board are working together and establishing an arrangement and we're hoping to launch an inaugural workshop in October this year. So stay tuned on this. In terms of data, we're really excited. We've um, worked with, we have signed a collaborative deed agreement with um, Australian Marine Park and, and the Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment on and we have signed the first small project so we can, we're going to see some data set being delivered some historical data set that are falling into some of those area which are in pink on this map um, over in this first half of the year came out here is another um, area another bunch of data will be delivered. That's part of our Australian Research Data Common Platform project that we have received. We need some data to test the platform that, so you can create your own map. And that data <clears throat> decided to work into Bass Strait area. The priority one for those test data sets is within that little red box here. And then if we can, we're going to move into priority two. The objective here is to test the platform, but we also want to make sure that any data that we process to test the platform will also be made available to everyone for use through the regular portal. Another very exciting project we have is with the new marine and coastal hub, the new the, the new the NEST program, NEST 2 we call. In this one, we're going to be revising the national areas of interest. So we're going to be broadening the number of users to be able to put their national areas, the, their areas of interest where they want to see seabed mapping occur. At the moment, it sits with the Commonwealth entity and state government. And then, but we'll expand that for multi-stakeholder we will also be working um, to look at areas for mapping, but both physical and biological. So really put these, these priority together. And this will be able to feed in different other workflows, uh, such as the Marine National Facility, uh, uh, to make plans for future survey or the Australian Hydrographic Office and their, um, their annual planning process. As mentioned, we are going to enhance the portal with new functionalities based on what we heard from you, what you wanted to see. So those are going to be um, some dynamic coloring, uh, make it easier for decision and for exploring or for downloading data and for really making it a one stop shop. The big project from the Australian Research Data Common, uh, the GMRT OCBED platform. What this platform 
Well, too, is as we know, right now we're delivering multiple singular survey data set on the portal. These data set, we want to be able to pull them together through the tool that is user control. The user will define what they want to see, how they want to see it on top, on the bottom, transparent, and make your own coverage map. Those can be a full or a select coverage. At the end of this year, we're going to have a prototype ready. It will be able to create those seamless uh, map. It's important to know that it's not just it's it's to go from tr uh, terrestrial all the way to um, well offshore. We're going to work on that integrated data delivery pipeline. This is really, and it's in the back end. Uh, the The only way of the users to see the difference is is in the speed at which you see your data delivered. So it's really important. Um, we're not going to be able to deliver those thousands of data sets that exist if we don't have more efficient way of ingesting, or if we don't improve the way we ingest, process, and deliver, and in an automated way and a repeatable way. So we'll continue working on this. This is something that will obviously spend more than um, a year. And finally, the last one is another piece of data sets. We're partnering with the University of Western Australia. As you can see in blue on the map, this is the area that we know we have multi-beam or sonar data. In the red, it's all the 3D seismic surveys that sits uh, that are open file, and they sit onto um, the national system at Geoscience Australia. It's accessible. Um, and in red, you can see that it covers a lot of the areas where there's big gaps in information and sonar data. So with the University of Western Australia, we're going to go and produce bathymetric map out of the seismic data over those 350 available um, surveys. So that's going to be very exciting, lots of new data and trying to map the gaps here. So are we there yet? Well, that is the question. I think I'd like to just summarize by saying, what do we expect and when? So this summarizes, you know, from your perspective, from sitting uh, on the uh, end user point, um, just to say that in the first years, what you could do in 2016 to 2018, the data was there. Well, lots of the data is there and, and it, it's in catalogs. You can find it. But when we started, we started to make the data more visual, when in the portal, try to assemble it. That made a huge um, improvement, and we saw so much more data going out. So it was there, but it was difficult to discover. Um, so we've improved this, and we're pushing more data. What we're going to do this year, as mentioned, is we're going to enhance the visualization. Uh, you can see and do it how you can explore. And we're going to allow for this map creation. And then as we continue, as we move forward towards um, the following year, we're going to be able to use all of this for all data types, all seabed mapping data and more. We want to be able to integrate that data and to make decision out of it. For the one we're left alone, but during that time, again, data, 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 it's the important part. How do we um, push this out? We're going to continually keep pushing it out, um, moving together and make it available. So here I am trying to answer that first question. Are we there yet? Well, I would say we're not. We set ourselves to 2030, so that's good. We're still 2021, got time to go. But what's important here is we've got all the ingredients put together at this point, three years into it. We have a really big community and we're talking and we're moving forward. It's growing. We have data 
and that is growing again. We know where it is, we need to uncover it. We've got an infrastructure trying to make it easier all the time and to coordinate or to access, and we're improving on it. And we have co-investment. We're coming together to make sure that this program is sustained. And we're coming together because Evos is a strong strategic drivers um, going forward. The oceans are not going to go in the back uh, anymore. I think they're coming to the forefront more and more, and the, those drivers are there to make sure that we can continue what we set ourselves to do and deliver. So this is a bit of an inspirational slide and a call to action at the same time. There are many um, boats out there collecting data and sharing. So for everyone, if you wonder how you can help or, um, yeah, is, is to share the data, is to help us find that data, it's to map the gaps, it's to use the guidelines that were provided so we can, um, again, ingest and acquire for other users, think of them, and provide feedback. We just really want to be on top. There's many ways to contact us or contact um, someone and let us know, so please do so. Finally, through that, this, um, this talk, I, I peppered in um, some news about tomorrow's workshop. So if you're interested to hear more, you can always go on the website or you can join also our webinar tomorrow. We're going to be talking about how to request um, some areas to be mapped and considered for the Australian Hydrographic Office plans. We're going to do some training on the new quality assurance tool that we collaborated with um, some North American partners, the Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping, as well as NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. We give a bit of a training on the data portal and expose the um, seismic derived bathymetry project. So in there, we're going to uh, we're going to have some guidelines established as well as data set being produced, and we want your input. We want to know um, what we should um, care as we move along and, and go forward with. So thank you for your attention and I'm always happy to answer any question or uh, you can email me or our team and then go from there. Thank you everyone. Thanks Kim. Uh, there are some questions in the chat uh, so I'll ask the first one. So it seems that the focus is on relatively deep sea. What's the reason for excluding shallow waters such as the Bass Strait? Well, that's a good question. Um, we're not excluding shallow water. The, the problem, well, not the problem, but one of the challenge with uh, mapping is that the shallow waters takes a lot more time to map. And so um, while we have, as I mentioned, we have a national deep water vessel, the RV investigator, and it maps in the deeper, but it also maps in the shallower. It's just a footprint. It's so much smaller. The Australian Hydrographic Office is running a program called the Hydro Scheme Industry Partnership Program. They are on uh, for a long time, a long-term program where they're going to map the shallow, but it just takes a lot of time. So the focus is in the shallow, it just takes time. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, another question. Uh, looking at your aims for the coming years, how much more data, like in square kilometres, do you aim to gather? And will you have the at sea resources, such as Investigator, uh, to complete the program, or will you need more? <laughs> so <clears throat> I can't say how many more square kilometre. Well, we're aiming to have uh, the seismic 3D imagery project bring that over two years. So we're hoping to have probably around 300,000 square kilometers from that one. I talked about the ARDC project in Bass Strait, as well as the Australian Marine Park project. So that's probably of the same 
nature or size that will be delivered. Um, but yeah, it's a continuous. So we haven't put ourselves on the on how many exactly. Um, yeah, so I'll leave that there. Sorry, Marie, what was the second part of the question? Do you have enough at sea resources to get uh, them? No, we'll be here <laughs> for a long time. <laughs> I mean, it's a simple. Um, no, I think the, the Marine National Facility doesn't just map for our. Um, doesn't just map it does other things as well for oceanography and many um, other sciences um we do and we have the australian antarctic um, division with the new naguna vessel that's going to come on board and it probably it will not probably be a mapping until a while but it will extend to going to antarctica obviously and mapping this um great area so we are we're limited. Everyone would like to go faster, but um, I don't think we have everything we can. Just need more boat and more money, really. It's a patience. Easy. Huh? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Another question, different tack. Uh, where is the line drawn between sub bottom data and full on seismic reflection data? <laughs> That's a very good uh, $100 question. So, sub bottom profile data, we refer to it. It's mainly the line is drawn in the frequency it uses to map uh, the subsurface. So, for us, it's a higher frequency with sub bottom profile, um, and therefore it penetrates less. The amount of penetration it will go to will depend on the substrate. So, um, for instance, in Australia, as you will have heard of my accent. I'm Canadian. Um, in Australia, the seafloor is quite hard and there's not that much sediment and therefore the penetration in the, in the orders of tens of meters. But in Canada, where there's, there's a lot of sediment or in Antar well, some part of Antarctica, you can go to 300 meter with a sub bottom profile, but it's still through soft material. It doesn't traverse the um, consolidated um, rocks, I guess, uh, below. It stops where the rock starts. So that's how we, we consider sub bottom from seismic. Seismic goes through the rocks, the hardened uh, substrate. All right, thanks, Kim. Uh, another question. Uh, so people are interested to know if you found any interesting features uh, through the data. Uh, either well-known ones like the Java Trench or new ones like large seamounts or anything like that? Well, I didn't, but everyone who's working on the data did. <laughs> There's always something to find. That's why I love seabed mapping. Um, if you look through the Schmidt Ocean Institute in the Coral Sea under their blog, and uh, Dr. Robin Beeman um, has published uh, published an article on it. Uh, they were mapping in the Coral Sea again, and then they found these uh, this big drowned reef, a 500 meter feature that popped from the, the surrounding sea floor up. That was unknown, which is, uh, quite uh, interesting, you know, to think that we don't know. We've seen this all over, over and again, that things we don't know. So there was this. Um, yeah, I've been exploring this Mid Ocean Institute data. So if you go, the most recent one that got published is the one from the southwest corners. Beautiful canyon coming off the shelf edge and landslide in this area. That's very fantastic. And I would say, some of the parks, the marine parks data we see, and there's all these, there's definitely a lot of reefs in those area. And some of those reefs are quite isolated and therefore they're really important. That's why we go map these. While it looks like it's a really flat bottom to many people, um, that isolation of these reefs is critical because it provides that habitat for a lot of the the species out there and they don't move around that much and therefore it's it's their focus area. So there's a lot of this in some of the new data that we collected on um, uh, the National Environmental Science Program. So yeah, go discover. It's all online. 
Thanks, Kim. Uh, I was also a comment that it looked like the MH370 data was available in the portal. Did you want to make comment on that? No, but it's been available for uh, actually it's probably our best model data set. It's very extensive. It's got multiple um, types of data in that area and it's so large. Um, so now you can go um, and, and explore that one. It's been there for, yeah, I think uh, the best of three years now for sure. So uh, yeah, it's always nice to explore this way. And it shows on that, I know I've said that line many times, but I'll say it again. Um, when I say we need to collect um, and consider our, our neighbors, and this is important, the best example on the MH370 is we collected transit data. We didn't know at the beginning that it would last such a long time in the search, and by collecting that transit between port, we collected an area larger than the search area itself. And now a uh, big area that see that has been mapped. So don't think because you're going over that same area, you shouldn't be collecting. There's always ways of collecting a bit more and, and knowing more. And I, I would say on this note, again, um, point to D Dr. Robin Bean, and again, he's leading one of the effort on crowdsourced bathymetry. So getting little sensor on the boat to record the sonar data that comes on your fish finder. And because of that, he, um, he's able to improve the Great Barrier Reef knowledge of the C4 there. So and that's done globally. There's a big effort through the CBIT 2030 project to do that. Let's give me another question. Uh, do you know when the Deloitte economic study will be released publicly? Well, this is great because that's the last phrase I didn't say at the end. Uh, there's many of the reports um, in the, the webinar and information I mentioned through that, including the Deloitte. Uh, that's just on the cusp um, to be published. I would, by the end of September, it will be out. Um, hopefully my colleague is in agreement with me. <laughs> But yeah, it should be in the next month, along with our work plan for this year. Great, thanks. And there's uh, one other question which you may or may not be able to answer. I'm not sure about this one. Uh, do you know of any efforts to see if marine corals are moving southwards towards colder waters? Whoa, that's definitely uh, not in my <laughs> area. Um, so any effort, I don't know. Um, really um i know there's uh, yeah i don't want to speculate i think here <laughs> i will leave that to the, uh, the others thanks kim all right so i think that takes us to the end of the questions so um thanks kim for your presentation today uh, and thank you to our audience for your participation uh, so we hope to see you next week where our seminar is Flood Vulnerability Research at Geoscience Australia presented by Dr. Ken Dale. So the talk will provide an overview of flood vulnerability research at GA and its utility in informing community flood risk reduction. Uh, it covers work looking at tangible and intangible costs as well as assessing the cost effectiveness of structural mitigation options. Uh, so we hope to see you then. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we put the link to next, um, well, sorry, that's tomorrow's seminar is in there. Um, plus, if you need to get in touch with Kim or the Oz Seabed team, the details are on the screen at the moment. So thanks very much, everyone, for joining, and hopefully we'll see you next week.